All right. Hey, everybody. We're with Bob Moz. Bob is one of my favorite people uh, in the world. Um, and Bob, oh, is currently, Bob is currently running the Techstars music program out of L.A. Uh, but I really think that his path and story so far uh, could be extremely interesting for everybody. Uh, so I suggested that we had a quick chat. And this is probably going to become a series that we'll do on the Soundcharts blog. So, hey, Bob. Hi. I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be the first victim. Yes, you are definitely a victim here. Um, so yeah, we're going to uh, basically quick start. I think everybody uh, would be interested to understand your story uh, before you kind of explain exactly what you do today. Mm -hmm. um, so just quick start. Uh, where were you born? Where are you from? Uh, well, I was born in Washington, D.C. on the East Coast, but I grew up in a town called Fort Collins in Colorado. It's a little town uh, like an hour north of Denver. It's actually closer to the Wyoming border in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming than it is to Denver. Like so it's a cool place, like a very nice, but like far from uh, L.A., New York, London, Paris. And you said about 150,000 people live there. Yeah, like, well, now there's 150,000 people who live there. Like when I was a kid, it was like more like 75,000 people. Like it's oh. a little a little college town. And were, were, like were your parents in the music or tech industry or not at all? Uh, yeah, my dad was in tech, uh, kind of. He worked for the federal government. So he built um, these big, massive uh, IP telephony networks for the Department of Agriculture. And there was a big like federal computer center in Fort Collins, which is why we moved there from Washington, D.C. when I was like three. And then my brother was born in Fort Collins. Um, but my dad used to go to work at the – it was called the Fort Collins Computer Center. And it was like out by the highway. And it had big those big reel-to-reel -reel, like mainframe computers and the punch cards. And the, it was like a super cool place to go as a kid. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm guessing um, kind of growing up with computer, even if not in the big city, still growing up with computers and being in touch with the way tech was evolving pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. So my mom is a social worker. So she works like in local hospitals and um, and places of, of healthcare spots up and down uh, the front range of Colorado. Um, but my dad worked the whole time for the Department of Agriculture. So he would make sure that my brother and I grew up like knowing how to use computers. Um, our first computer at home was a, a K-Pro 64 which was like the world's first like com like portable computer. It was like this metal box that had like two. You you can Google it and insert do some fancy uh, image inserting. Um, yeah. Like uh, it was like a metal box with a keyboard folded up into the into it, and you could put five and a half two five and a half inch floppies into it, and it had a sixty four k hard drive. A, a portable, a portable. Yeah, thing. it weighed like three hundred pounds. Like yeah, oh, like like you had, it had like um uh like Halliburton style like case clips that would clip the keyboard to the metal box. Um, oh and I, and I very like vividly remember when we got it, like 1982, 83, something like that. Um, I remember people coming to our house to see the computer. Like people came over, like my mom would have to like put out some dip and some chips and some veggie plate. Like, why is everybody coming over? Like, oh, they're coming to see the computer. Like that's, it was a, uh, it was a cool thing. That's amazing. Um, so, um, I, I know that you started at Yahoo Music, uh, pretty what people would call pretty late for music and tech <laughs> career. I think I think you were in your early thirties. Um, yeah. What, okay. So you, I'm, I, I'm, I started at Yahoo Music. Like everybody's like, oh, you were a product manager at Yahoo, and I was like, yes, I was. But before that, I was an intern, um, which is a uh, um, like a little known thing. It's like it's a funny story. Is I was going to grad school at Carnegie Mellon. I was sort of like a like early thirties like career change. I'd worked in. Um, media and publishing, um, gotten a master's degree in journalism or an uh, undergraduate degree in journalism. I was getting a master's degree in like entertainment management and I had to do an internship um, and I was working um, for a movie producer and a big movie star, story for another time, and I, I didn't like that at all. Like that was not for me. Um, and my friend Cody Sims, who I had worked with, was working, uh, had just left the New York Times and was working uh, at Yahoo, and he introduced me to Ian Rogers and Michael Spiegelman, who then introduced me to Dave Goldberg. And Ian and Michael, Michael's now like one of the heads of product at Netflix, and uh, you know Ian's in Paris at LVMH, but like lots of people know who Ian Rogers is in, in music tech. Um, they convinced Dave Goldberg, um, who is one of the great you know sort of tech leaders of of the last twenty years, and has so many people that he got his gave his you know gave their starts. Um, Dave like took a flyer on me as an intern at, at 32, which is totally like, you know, crazy. Like nobody else would, would, would do that. Um, and then I, a year later I graduated and they made me a product manager, which was a pretty amazing thing. So, um, yeah, you like, took quite a, you took quite a big leap for, 
from day one. Yeah, we took you took quite a big leap from media and journalism to tech. Um, so not only, of course, uh, some people trusted you and actually gave you a shot, even if it was an intern shot, usually everybody yeah. starts kind of as an intern. Uh, what made you kind of do the flip at, at 30, wanting to restart? Uh, I mean, I, I, I'd always loved music and tech, like always. Um, I just grew up in a place where I didn't think that like having a career in music and tech was possible. Um, it wasn't that I was like... Um, like I, I, like I wasn't like I, I, I knew was more talented and had better skills than I realized, I guess is how to put it. Like I was managing bands. I was actively building things. I mean, Brad Barish who worked with us at Topspin and who works now at Sonos, he and I built a music site uh, at the university of Kansas in 1996. Had he, you know, been at Stanford or UCLA or NYU or somewhere around any kind of venture capital community, we could have raised millions of dollars. Um, it was, you know, it was in the age of like Sonic, like Sonic net came two years after our site. Um, instead we got a B on it in class and went, you know, our separate ways. Um, and it wasn't until I moved back to LA and was working at Yahoo that we reconnected and we brought them in, into, into top spin later. So like I had all the, there was like a bunch of things where I could have worked in music and tech. I just didn't realize that I, that it was possible. It took me a long time to realize that I could participate in that sort of global ecosystem. So what, what, what do you think, uh, if, if you met uh, now the 19-year-old uh, Bob, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's always a tricky one, but if you yeah. met the 19-year-old, what would you, would you tell him, like, kind of trust your gut, trust your talent, or uh, uh, geography doesn't really matter, or? Uh, yeah, like, I, yeah, well, first of all, I'd be like, hey, don't worry about it. You're going to meet the best woman ever. Like, the person you marry is going to change your life. Like, my wife totally changed my life. So I'd be like, hey, like, that woman's coming to save you. Um so that would be the first thing I would say. And then the second thing I would be like, like I was always a ravenous music fan. Like I was a big, big punk rock kid. Um, I still am in terms of like what I like to listen to. Uh, and the ethos of like get in the van, right? That flag ethos of like, just do it. Like just, what are you waiting for? Just start. Um, I, I really should have leaned into more. Like that's, that's where I come from. It's what I believe in. Like I've come all the way back around, right? I'm the 43 year old straight edge guy, right? Like, um, like I think that that, I should have just listened. Like I, it was right there. I believed in it, and I didn't connect that like I was could be part of that and participate. I thought everybody else was like more talented than me or bigger or whatever. It's a feeling we all have, you know what I mean? Like you have to have like that first experience where you're like, oh, I can do this. Like I can, I can participate here. Um, and I just wish I had done it earlier. So, but you know, like, look, I'm super stoked with how it worked out. So maybe like I needed those years, like learning how to work hard and pay my mortgage and all that stuff. Yeah. Like, Sometimes if you have it too easy, too early, it, it creates like a uh, human debt. Uh, it's like, that yeah. You don't look, know. Like it's never been, it's never been easy. Like, um, like I, I can't, I can't say it's ever been easy, but I feel like maybe like it just worked out the way it was supposed to work out. Sure. Um, so yeah, we are, um, we're basically, uh, speaking a bit about, about, about the past. Uh, we mentioned Yahoo music and then between Yahoo and Techstars, um, you went from Yahoo to top spin from top spin to Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, when thinking about this interview, I realized that basically you went from a not so startup, extremely large tech company, which was Yahoo at the time. Uh, if you go back in time, Yahoo at the time was literally the juggernaut, uh, um, uh, yeah, of, big of company. Web. Startup, big company, and then, and then kind of yeah, and then Twitter was kind of the huge startup on its way to, to becoming uh, before I think it was a public company. Um, just before, just barely before, like I, like you know, I got in, I started at Twitter. I think like six weeks later, the company went public. Like it was a very like, it was a big company by then, right? Yeah, it was already company. on its way to be like oh yeah, gosh, yeah, yes, yeah. it was for filed sure. filed for IPO and so forth. So what's your yeah. if you had to do a, like a quick learning of um, um, uh, Yahoo to Topspin to Twitter. What are the learnings from a huge company to a startup to a large startup? Um, what are the things you would keep and not keep um, from, yeah. from those three experiences? Um, I, well, I would keep all of it. I would totally keep all of it. Um, some of it was harder than and others, and some of it was more enjoyable than others. Like it was a um, Yahoo was just me learning how to like work in a corporate environment in tech and learn how, like realize that I could participate and my voice was good. And like, I learned about how to manage, um, uh, monetization and users and track growth and, and, you know, 
to how to hold yourself accountable for building product that people use and, and all that sort of like and it was an amazing place to start because there's millions of people using Yahoo Music, right? At the time it was like twenty five million MAUs using those services and we had to deal with the rights and the budgeting and we had to shut radio service down and we had to shut the streaming service down and we'd transfer that to Rhapsody. Um, so there was tons of that stuff like like just in the generations of streaming music where this learned so much. Um, the Music Match product was better than the Yahoo product, but they shut the Music Match product down. And we like just for a bunch of reasons, like you just learned a lot of lessons about how big companies operate and what what music costs, like the uh, on the internet. Topspin was like you thought you knew what you were doing, and we just like we messed it up so many different ways. Um, like I feel really glad that that company sort of put a dent in the universe and changed the way direct to fan marketing works and helped artists make millions of dollars. So and for, for the people like, who might not know, Topspin was basically the first venture backed uh, D2C artist to fan commerce store. There was other companies doing it around, but it was the venture backed companies, the one that had the largest scale at the time. Yep. And, and, you know, we grew it from zero to $20 million in GMB. Like it wasn't at, at a, you know, at its peak, it was, um, you know, the most powerful, most robust, like it was too complicated to use, like it didn't have a great user experience, but it worked, like it made people like buckets of money. Um, and it, so I'm really learning like how much, you, how important usability is and really learning about how important self-serve sustainable growth is, um, you know, chasing revenue rather than, than sustainable, happy customers. Like there's a bunch of, like, a, like that's a whole other conversation. There's just a, a million things learned there. Um, but I also learned that like, there are things that I didn't know that I thought I did. And when I got to Twitter, I, I think people like valued my opinion in ways that I didn't expect. And, and people cared about things because um, when you work in a startup for five years and it's really hard and you're slogging your way through it, everything seems like it's on fire all the time. Everything is an emergency and you feel like you don't get anything accomplished. And you really accomplish an awful lot and you learn tons of things. And it's and the the value of those skills gets like comes back to you in ways that you just can't you can't appreciate until you're like you're on the other side of it. Like this will happen for you with sound charts, right? Like like success or failure, like no matter what happens to sound charts, you have learned so much stuff, right? You're a music yeah. manager, then you're a mar you know, a marketer or the manager, and then you're like, oh, I'm gonna run a, a tech company. And your journey doing that is like cr crazy amounts of learning in rapid amounts of time. And the human being that you'll be on the other side, like you're just you're so much more powerful than you could ever imagine, right? It's like that scene in Star Wars where Obi Wan gets killed, and then he's like, "If you strike me down, you'll make me more powerful than you can ever imagine," right? Like, that's the same for yourself. Like, you just don't realize what you're capable of. And I got to Twitter, and everybody was like, "Wow, that guy knows what he's doing." And I was like, "I don't have any idea what I'm yeah. doing." What you, <laughs> you know? learn? You learn a lot more in adversity than you learn in any type of success, for sure. Um, totally, yeah. totally, right? Um, and then to finish and answer your question, and then I'll shut up. Um, and at Twitter, it was like, how do you do this at planetary scale and what matters and, and how do you do it? And, you know, we tried to do a couple of things there that were sort of this big, like this big, giant, like outside the frame big. And it didn't and it didn't work. And it just, you know, and that's OK. And that's that was a whole nother lesson of like, you know, life in the major leagues is like, here's these big, sexy things and really ambitious uh, plans. And they don't always work out. And you're better off being in the arena, you know, being the person trying to do it sweating it out and failing than you are sitting on the sidelines uh, watching. And so, you know, the first, you know, year I was at Twitter was amazing and I learned a ton and then it like kind of all fell apart and not, for plenty of good reasons. Um, and we didn't do what we planned to do. And so then the second year I was there, it was like not that great. Um, like, you know, my job went from this to this and it wasn't that interesting. Um, and it's a great company and I learned a ton of amazing things. And again, you can get to build product and put things out, right? That little play button in the Twitter, in the Twitter, uh, feed, you know, that's, um, you know, three or four people did that. Like it didn't take hundreds of people to do that. Um, and those three or four people I still talk to and I'm, and we're really proud of it and it's still in there today and people still listening to stuff and discovering stuff today because of that, that like, you know, that matters. And there's like a, there's a dopamine hit from building something and putting it out there that millions of people use. Yeah. I was going to say, it's not putting it out there for a few hundreds. Hopefully it's putting right. it out there. And from right. the first day you have to limit the push of the feature to like 0.01% of the people. Mm -hmm. You just yep. don't push a feature. If you're a small startup, you put a feature, you're really proud. You just push it. <laughs> when you're Twitter, you push it to like 0 0.001 and yeah. you see how it, how it goes. The scale is massive that it's kind of scary and it, it could freeze you uh, before actually launching. Um, yes. We, like, like, so that was a great lesson. But it also taught me that like 
I like um, value creation. Like I'm not much of an administrator. Like I, I wouldn't um, – like I'm not the guy you hire to run a team of 300 people. I'm not an administrator or someone who, who runs a business. I'm a person who creates businesses and creates concepts and creates value. And I, I could never be eloquent about that or understand that's who I was until I've had all those experiences. And I realized like helping at the, at the, at the creation of value is where I'm most useful and, and happiest too. And, and, and actually at some very, very large companies, um, they have those amazing operators, but they also keep uh, always amazing creative minds uh, that can maybe um, 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 change a little bit the internal thought process. Uh, while, while you need to operate this as a very large scale company, you need to have some sparkle, some internal disruptor. I don't really like disruption. The <laughs> word. It's like the one word that's everywhere, but you need like those internal minds, people that speak their mind, that can create value, try to create new products within products. Uh, and it's the marriage of those two that actually re re really works in large, in large companies. Um, yeah. All right. And so fast forward a little bit. Um, uh, uh, right now you're, you're running Techstars. It's the third class. Uh, of Techstars music. Uh, mm -hmm. For the people who don't know overall what is Techstars, regardless of the music program, can you just kind of sum mm -hmm. it up in a, in a second? Yeah, sure. So we talk about Techstars as a global network to help entrepreneurs succeed. Um, practically, I think, we're, I think we are now officially the world's largest seed stage investor. Um, we run 45 accelerator programs around the world. Techstars Music, Techstars Mobility, Techstars LA, Boulder, Chicago, Seattle, Singapore, London, um, we Paris. have per Paris totally. Yeah, there you go. Um, we've got programs that are focused on locations, um, and we have, uh, programs that are focused on topics. And so I run, uh, Techstars music. Um, and we do that in partnership with a bunch of global music business companies. Um, so, uh, RLPs, if you think about them that way, is people who, uh, who help support and fund the program and, and also provide mentorship and access and like help for the companies who are in the program. Um, those are the Warner Music Group, Sony, uh, like globally Sony, right? Sony US Music, Sony Innovation Fund, Sony Music Japan, uh, Avex, the largest record label and management company in, in, in Japan, uh, Record Shoku is large DSP uh, in Japan, um, Peloton, the fitness company, they're new members um, this year. They're, they make the exercise bike and the treadmill and tons of content around music and, uh, and streaming video and, and music. Um, uh, Concord, right, the world's largest independent label. Um, Silva Artist Management, they manage the Foo Fighters and um, uh, uh, the Beastie Boys Estate and Queens of the Stone Age and Nine Inch Nails and Nora Jones. Um, Q Prime, they manage Metallica and the Black Keys and the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Eric Church and Muse, right, it's like giant uh, management companies. Um, and then here in LA, uh, Bill Silva Entertainment, right, Bill um, manages Lincoln Park, um, is one of the exclusive rock and roll promoter at the Hollywood Bowl. Um, and then in Denver, a company called Royalty Exchange, run by this guy named Matt Smith, who's like a super forward thinking um, entrepreneur around like, how do you uh, monetize and build um, sort of investment vehicles around uh, copyrights and uh, royalty streams. So all of those companies come together to work as a team to help us identify, nurture, capitalize, and then give platform to the 10 most interesting startups in music every year. And, you know, it's a... Um, from a, like a job career perspective, I feel like I've kind of created the, you know, like I'm, I've committed the perfect crime. Like I've created my dream job, which is every year I get to work with like the smartest, most interesting, um, you know, entrepreneurs who are trying from the very like earliest stages to build big global, like, you know, companies that are solving problems, uh, for music. So, um, I, I couldn't be happier. Like you're, you are an alum of our program, right? You're one of our sound charts is one of our portfolio companies. Um, you know, we've got portfolio companies in Australia and in England and in France and in Germany and in Spain. And it's like, and in Japan and in Canada and like all across the U S right? it's like, a um, in Sweden. So we like 30 companies through our portfolio. Um, you know, our intentions are to do this, you know, on into the future in an evergreen way. And what we're trying to do is attract more venture capital to the music ecosystem. Um, and we're trying to help these companies like, you know, do a year's worth of work in three months and, and, and really like reshape the way, you know, music and live entertainment and, you know, media consumption and, and entertainment works for, you know, for the future. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna list the, the companies of this year, uh, 
just below the video. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, please do. And I, I thought about asking you to, to name a couple of verticals that you focused on or, or, or a few startups. And then I thought it's kind of naming your favorite child and <laughs> you, you can't really do that. Um, do you want to speak maybe just a little bit about the few verticals that you've had in the programs? I know there is music making with AI and that's a very hot topic. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a company this year that is the Music Fund, which is creating algorithms to predict uh, the value of songs. Yeah, it's, a, it's a programmatic hedge fund for purchasing music copyrights. Like, it's yeah. pretty cool stuff. Yeah. What are, um, the, yes. what are the few verticals? Last year, I think there was a t like ticketing and blockchain company. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to kind of elaborate on this? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a couple of companies that are in our portfolio that are like, uh, that people know and who people who follow music tech have probably seen, right? But it's like, maybe they're not always positioned as our portfolio companies, right? So on the AI music making front, um, we have Popgun is in our portfolio uh, in Australia. Amper Music is in New York. Um, like two of sort of like the two global leaders in in making music with with AI. Um, they're both like the most highly capitalized, like most talented entrepreneurs, like biggest businesses going sort of in that in that space. So we're super lucky to have them. Um, we've got uh, on the sort of the the uh, blockchain rights management side, we have Jack in the UK, um, also from the first class of the program, like a company people probably recognize. Um, and then uh, we also have Tracer in Madrid, Spain, like doing a, a blockchain-based service layer for tickets, not on the front end, but on the on the back end, like making tickets portable so you can sell them on on, on any front end or distribute them around um, to other other sellers. Um, and so that those of like AI music making and um, and sort of that that sort of service layer around ticketing and and companies that touch the blockchain around around music have been in the past like notable companies from our portfolio. Um, but you know we also have Endel. Uh, who was, you know, sat next to you uh, last year in the program. Um, you know, they're based in Berlin. They're opening a U.S. entity here. They're currently the number one app in Japan at the moment, like in the whole country. Um, you know, building... Um, that, that, is, that is literally all topics, like all apps. Yeah. Like yeah, Facebook, they're, they're, WhatsApp, yeah. and... Uh, totally. Yeah. Crazy, right? Um, uh, which is pretty cool as an investor. Like, it's fun when you're the product guy who gets to make a thing that millions of people touch. It's also cool when you're, you get the same dopamine hit when you're the investor and your thing goes to the top of the... Uh, it's pretty, yeah. like, easy to get hooked on that, too. Um, sure. uh, but, yeah, like, they make... Um, they, use, they take your personal data and your biometrics and they create um, customized sound environments to help you relax or focus or go to sleep. Um, and that's sort of, like, how they've gone to market. That's their sort of first attack point. But the, uh, the company is really a, a, a controller for... Um, the environment, like how, who is, what's the brain of your smart home, right? If you say, Alexa, help me go to sleep. She needs to know what your heart rate is. She needs to know what your, how busy your day was or how, uh, how stressful your drive was. And so endo becomes a, a thing that can collect all of these inputs and then the outputs of it help you, um, have a better life and change your atmosphere. So the out, the, the outputs of the tech could be temperature or lighting or sound or video, or just like, Hey, like put my phone in the do not disturb modes, like push my alarm out 15 minutes, give me some clothes, you know, turn the lights down, cool off the air, let me go to sleep. Like the things that a smart home would do or a smart car cockpit could do um, come out of their of their tech. So we're, you know, that's a company that people will probably see more and more of, I think, this year. But like that's a company from last year. Um, you guys just relaunched your your platform, like via V2, like like. You guys are doing great. You got some of the most important people in music using you using your tech for business intelligence. We're super excited about that. Um, that's an area of interest for us, like in portfolio and thesis wise, like business intelligence around music and media. Um, we're really into that. Like you mentioned, the music fund, like that's part of it on the hedge fund side. Um, and then Blink Identity is the other one that I think people would probably like associate with us um, from last year, like facial recognition and iris scanning at high speeds. Um, raised some money from us and a, a really smart venture company called Sinai Ventures and then Live Nation. And they're, they're experimenting with um, the guys at Ticketmaster around like in the future, can your face be your ticket? Like how does identity work back of house? How does it work front of house? Can we make, um, you know, these secure environments more secure and safer? And also can we just create a better experience for people when they're, when they're in venues or, or buildings? Like ultimately that, that company might be a door company. It might be a commercial real estate company, but, like music and live entertainment and venues are like um, like a good place for it to test the tech. Yeah, you start by you start by shortening the line uh, at the general admission for Coachella. You go to shortening the like he heightening and increasing security for VIP access and artist passes and so forth. And then mm -hmm. you go into uh, controlling hospitals um, uh, right. when when people have to go with gloves through doors and they don't want to beep and stuff. Um, 
Yep. Um, and I think Handel is the same. I, I, they always start with music. The jobs to be done is, hey, I want to relax, play some music. But actually, I want to relax could be turn down the volume, change the temperature, play some audio that does not have mm -hmm. to be uh, music and so forth. Um, cool. I see that we've passed the 25th minute mark and I wanted to keep my 25 minute mark. Oh, OK. So, uh, no, no, no. So I'll, 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 I'll wrap it up. I'll, I'll jump, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in the last two things. Um, it's also for you and to make it digestible for, for, for everybody. But I know you've had a crazy long day. Um, so one very open question that you can literally go anywhere. What excites you in, in the music industry right now? Uh, people are talking about the artist producer, everybody being self-produced, uh, getting lead funding mm -hmm. without long term contracts. Um, mm -hmm. the rise of streaming and how catalog music is actually exploding and helping uh, a lot of the repertoire owners that own a lot of catalog, um, the new ticketing and how blockchain can change ticketing, AI and music making. There's so many topics right now. Um, it's going to help us also maybe select some people to do interviews and choose our topics wisely. Oh, OK. Um, All right. No, you no are, pressure then. Yeah, I gotta no, I gotta no, say something no smart pressure. Here. Yeah, but you're literally selecting 10, 10 companies who could be doing 10 completely different things. The thread is music. Um, so I'm interested, yeah. what is the most okay. exciting thing for you? Okay. Maybe well, the, the two most, most exciting, if you can decide. Okay, so uh, two most exciting. Uh, one is just like the implication of how we manage media. Like uh, my son's nine, he, all, he talks to Alexa nonstop all day. Um, he has no concept of albums. He has no concept of, of media brands. He has no concept of playlisting or groups of songs. His relationships are with Alexa and with the artist or the song name. Um, and he gets to crazy things like he gets into like he's playing crazy stuff in his room and i'm not, i'm not sure how how he's doing it um whether it's like a combination of what other kids are listening to and word of mouth plus him asking questions and how he navigates it but he is actually like weirdly discovering things in the voice environment and there's a big the you know like a whole thread in music right like how do we prepare for voice how do we what's the metadata look like what's the tagging look like how do we like read emotions there like we've made a couple of investments this year in, in companies that are that are relevant here um Alexa, you heard about you heard about the play some christmas music sorry uh the, no the, i was gonna say so, like play a sad song like you want to oh, like so, back so, to those kind of questions yeah so for for example so, that, so that's that, that's funny um the um, i think it's sony i think it's sony i'll put it in the comments but i think it's sony they released a christmas album that is called some christmas music because the number one request on Alexa is Alexa, play, play some some Christmas, music. some Christmas music, and because the album tag is exactly that, it would show up. So right. if you play a, play me some play me some heavy metal, you could have a compilation that is called some heavy metal, and usually Alexa would push it. I think Alexa, the Amazon people cut that and they changed a little bit so that yeah. it would show up. Like the, but, the window of manipulating that stuff is closing, right? Like yeah, that, it's, so it's that's, like when, that window's over. Yeah, it's like oh. when people were reploading on iTunes the same artist all over again because it was all ranked by date of publication. Um, but I think the way you query Alexa and how if you say play something to relax me, does it go for a chill song? Does it go for a chill playlist? Does it go for a song that has the word relax in it? So here's what I, what I like better is like in my house, there's my voice, my wife's voice, my son's voice, my daughter's voice. We have one Alexa account. Um, we all have different preferences. And so what I'm excited about are the companies that are going to put like not to like help us manipulate that like play some Christmas music. Uh, but better, like when I say Alexa play a sad song, I get something off Blood and Chocolate, the saddest record ever made. And... My son says, Alexa, play a sad song, and he gets, you know, uh, uh, When Will I See You Again, right? The Wiz Khalifa song. And my daughter says, play me a sad song, and she gets an ABBA song because she's in love with ABBA at the moment. And my wife gets a different song, right? Like, so, like, that part, um, my wife would get Mazzy Star. So, um, that, like, that, like, world is coming, and it's, yeah. like, a totally different relationship with content and, and uh, the interfaces, and, like, yeah, I'm super even, excited about that stuff. That's not even device personalization based on who, like, who are you with right. your device? That is one device to multiple people, so voice recognition, yep. context. Um, yeah, that's, yep. that, that's one of the most interesting things. I'm super into that. And then the other thing I'm super into is that I think every kid in the world in the next two or three years will have all the tools <laughs> they need to become a global pop star. Make music, distribute music, analyze Everything. your data, see it like, yeah. Um, any, mar any, market, any, market your music, yeah. All of it, all of it, from any from any piece of dirt anywhere on the planet. You want it yeah. to be in New York, you want it to be in LA, you want it to be in London, you could be in rural Ghana and you could be a global superstar. And I think it's like two years away. Yeah, and it's starting, and it's starting. You can see things bubbling up and yeah. the, the huge US label signing a lot of non-US, non-UK act. What Look, actually like, the majors called non-UK, non-US is becoming <laughs> It's becoming bigger the, than UK US. The entire market. Like by yeah. thesis, by thesis, we invest fifty percent of our 
uh, capital every year outside the United States, right? Because we think that's where most of the growth and the opportunity lies. Um, you know, and across Techstars, we have sort of a thesis that, um, and a statement that we that we push ourselves on all the time, like as we're evaluating companies, which is that um, talent is distributed evenly, opportunity is not. And I think like we're in a world where opportunity is starting to be more and more and more evenly distributed and music and media creation and that sort of stuff. Entertainment is one of the first places where we'll actually realize it. I mean, you can see it already, right? Like the Colombians destroyed the, the music streaming charts over the last two years. Um, they've just totally dominated it, right? The hottest studio in the world was in, was in Colombia. Um, and so that, I think that's like not a, an outlier that's a sign of like the things to come like it's yeah. the rise of the rest it's coming there, is, there, is, there are amazing companies who are completely uh, full remote now that was very hard before it kind of circles yeah. back as uh, a good like question it kind of circles back to you at 19 not being in la uh, probably uh, <laughs> like building building websites remotely was harder today you can hire an amazing designer and work remote um, I was talking to a couple of tech people yeah, totally. today. One is in Spain, and I don't really care or mind that he's in Spain. I want to hire the best. Um, that will apply little, little by little to music. You can have, a, for the management uh, client that we still have, uh, our uh, digital strategy is in LA, and we are based out of Paris, and that really doesn't That's matter. That's fine. It right? works yeah. fine. Yeah, you're right. Like, it's good. You're a good talk show host. Like Bring that full circle, right? Like, you, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, um, nice. you, you noticed. I just did it accidentally. That was good. That's good. Yes. Thing. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, and so, yeah, last question. It's, uh, I think, 6.50 right now in LA. What are you going to do after this interview? I'm going to close my laptop lid. I'm going uh, I'm gonna to run up with my laptop in my bag, get in my car, sit in traffic, and have dinner with a portfolio founder. That sounds cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for your time, man. Um, really, Anytime. thanks a lot. Dude, anytime. Like, uh, come on, this is a cool idea. I hope I hope you get a whole bunch of uh, really smart and good people on here. Like, I'm um, I'm very honored to be the first person. Cool. Thanks. See you later. All right. Bye.